coming up this week. The Canadian dog race in minus 30 degrees Celsius. Dogs are so excited, it's utter chaos. They're literally trying to pull the sled now. Just one second, go just do it, it's not worth it. The first Arab woman to scale one of the world's toughest mountains. Taking a little break on this very awkward rock formation. Alhamdulillah, never give up. And the former notorious Mexican prison that's now been given over to nature. Bordering Alaska and the Arctic Ocean, the Yukon Territory in northern Canada is wild, sparsely populated and unrelenting. This must be one of the most remote places I have ever been to. It's just snow and mountains and forest as far as the eye can see. This year marks 125 years since one of the most frantic gold rushes in history reached its peak. When gold was discovered here, over a hundred thousand prospectors traveled north hoping to get lucky, but the extreme conditions caused many to turn back. Many of those who did make it settled here in Dawson City, building a new life for themselves and their families, whilst First Nations people who had lived here for generations had to move upriver in an effort to protect their way of life. So the population of this town exploded from 1,500 to 30,000 people during the three-year rush. Roughly $29 million worth of gold was pulled from the ground around here during the three-year rush, but only a few made their fortune. Many who missed out found other reasons to stay, like Bonnie's grandfather. By the time he made it here, all the claims were taken and all of that, you know, and that's what happened to a lot of people, mm. you know, and so then they, they come this far, they may as well stay and make a living. A local legend, Percy the Wolf risked his life delivering mail along the Yukon River. His commitment to providing a lifeline between isolated communities in this frozen wilderness earned him the title Iron Man of the North. To honor him, the town now hosts an annual dog sledding race. The grueling route follows Percy's 210 mile mail trail from Dawson City across the border into the American state of Alaska. He was that type of a person. If he could come across Canada for the gold rush, he could do anything. <laughs> like, what do you think he would make of all this? I, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but I think it, it's great because it keeps his story alive and he was part of the fabric of Dawson City. It's not only the miners and the gold, there were people that did other things. There are dogs everywhere as the town gears up for tomorrow's race. What kinds of things are you checking for? Um, a little bit of everything, just kind of your standard like physical exam on a dog. Make sure that you don't have any signs of infection or like any wounds or anything, but mainly because they're going to be running for hundreds of miles. These checks are compulsory, and if a dog isn't considered fit, it won't be allowed to race. We uh, focus a lot on the orthopedic, um, so checking all their joints, uh, make sure that their muscles are not painful. But it's not just the dogs that are at risk. Traveling through the night in unpredictable weather conditions means the race can very quickly turn deadly. Two weeks ago tonight, we had a major blizzard event. It could be 30 below, so you know, just prepare for that right now. Sounds really intense. The river was particularly high this year, and so the ice on the trail is worse than it's been in a hundred years. 
we need to be able to communicate if stuff goes sideways, and I'll be the base comms for this. As the temperature drops, the competitors make their final preparations for tomorrow's brutal endeavor. You're used to it after you've done it many times. You know, you're used to going without sleep. You're, you're getting better at the cold. You're, you know, you're better at dog care when it's 40 below. You learn all those things. Uh, it's just an incredible feeling. Yeah. Yeah, hanging out with your best friends. How do the dogs feel about dog sledding? They're driven. They, they do it quite easily, much mm -hmm. easier than us. We're definitely the weak link. <laughs> Well, can we see you guys in action? Sure, let's go hook up. All right. Let's take you for a ride. Yes. You're going to sit in here. This is my spot? Yep. <laughs> You're going to sit in there, and then we'll hook the dogs up. Oh, oh hey, buddy. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, I guess you're coming along for the ride, aren't you? This is on another level. The dogs are so excited. It's utter chaos. They're literally trying to pull the sled now. I hope they don't manage, because Michelle is not here yet to drive it. So just, just one second. Go to the door. No way. Don't go anywhere. And we're off. Got a tiny little taster of what it must be like to do a race out in the wilderness with your dogs and I can definitely see the appeal. It's just so peaceful, so beautiful. It's just you and the nature and the animals and it's amazing. I think I understand it. I think I get it. Back in town, there's one more tradition that's an important part of the race. Part of what we do to commemorate Percy's life is to actually send mail. Mm -hmm. And so people actually have letters. We actually deliver them legally to the post office. You do? Oh yeah, and they put them in a package and we send them with the first musher to leave the starting line. Oh my gosh. So I'm just gonna steal a moment and write this letter. Right here, in front of Percy himself. Right. In the spirit of Percy, keep on adventuring. Love, The Travel Show, BBC. It's the morning of the race and the mushes are all starting to roll in. There's definitely a buzz in the air right now, but it's also absolutely freezing out here. The morning of the race has finally arrived. As the minutes count down, the tension is rising. This morning I was feeling quite nervous. Yeah? Oh my gosh. <laughs> but uh, I think it'll be great once we're actually out on the trail. We've got all the dog food, mandatory gear, so axe, uh, fuel, cooker, and a minus 40 sleeping bag, snowshoes. Whenever I'm out on the trail, I do always imagine what it would have been like back in the day. And I would imagine that also it. picturing someone who actually had to do this every single week, no fail. I had no idea it was a yeah. loop like that. Yeah. Eight days, getting people's mail. I would be like pregnant women into town by know, dog right? sled. That's pretty cool. Also a thank you to the city of Dawson and the Trundequichin for sponsoring the Percy DeWolf race. The bag of mail with my letter in it is handed over. Competing in these races today is a testament of the resilience needed to live in these conditions. Percy's spirit definitely lives on here in the north, and long may it continue to.
the mushes could be out there for up to 48 hours, which is more than me and the crew could handle. But Ayana has provided us with a little insight into just what it was like. It's so peaceful out here and it's snowing. It's not quite a whiteout. It's not snowing that hard, but yeah, it's kind of eerie in a sense. It's very peaceful. I've heard a few ravens calling, but mainly just the pitter patter of the dog feet. And the results are in. The winner of this year's Percy the Wolf race was our friend Michelle, completing it in an impressive 19 and a half hours. Ayana came third, gliding into town around four hours later. A little worse for wear, but looking surprisingly cheery. Still to come on The Travel Show. Another example of the lengths humans can push themselves to. I can't believe K2's right here, we're so close. And the prison turned tourist attraction on a Mexican island. So don't go away. Now for the next in our series about the amazing feats of endurance that some people put themselves through in the name of adventure. And this one is pretty awesome. K2 in northern Pakistan is one of the world's most dangerous mountains. And we've been talking to the first Arab woman to ever reach its summit. Here's her remarkable story. October 31, 2021 was the day I decided I wanted to do K2. It almost marked the one year mark of my dad passing away. I wanted this year to be my year of climbing, climbing back up through life, climbing through grief, climbing to honor my dad. What better than the Savage Mountain, especially because it hasn't been done from anyone in the region. More people have been to outer space than had climbed K2. It's a serious, risky climb. And one out of four people that attempt K2 die trying. On our fourth day or fifth day, that's when we saw K2 for the first time. And I can't believe K2 is right here. We're so close. Yeah, so far. I think that was the moment when I really felt like, oh my God, I can't believe that we're doing this. We had our Western guides, a team of Sherpas, Nepali climbers. They've climbed Everest and K2 several times. And then we have our porters, kitchen staff. So it was an entire army of people. But in terms of the climbers, we were four. There's always a lot of singing and climbing on mountains to keep the morale up. And so it just so happened that there were so many celebrations and music and, um, you know, just, again, like a, a celebration of different cultures. And I always bring my music with me and I'm always dancing as well. I dance when I feel my lowest. It seems like I'm happy, but usually the times that I'm dancing is when I need that push. Today I feel really sick. Um, my stomach bug has accelerated. I took antibiotics. It's nice to have this downtime. Nearly doing very good today. Going to come to Teredai. To be honest, I wasn't doing so good at the beginning. But yeah. these guys pushed me. We are close to the passive chimney, taking a little break on this very awkward rock formation. Alhamdulillah. Never give up. Where I camp to! Woo! The weather has <coughs> progressively gotten worse since yesterday. Weather on K2 is very turbulent, and that's what K2 is notorious for. It can go from feeling super warm and sunny, to having a full-blown blizzard, to then an avalanche happening, rockfall. Rockfall on K2 was the scariest thing. This is a really dangerous section because there's a lot of loose rocks. Rocks come flying in from a thousand meters above you, and sometimes they're boulders, not just rocks. And you hear them, they come flying in, and they sound like helicopters that's coming closer and closer. And it felt like a PlayStation game, honestly. The trail itself changes a lot. You're going from snow to ice to rock, because the rock can break, and there's rolling rocks. You don't want to roll any rocks on people underneath you. And the rope may snap. The most challenging aspect about the trip was it felt like the sense of safety on K2 was very minimal. Anything that happens to you above base camp, you're on your own. There are choppers that can come, 
but they may come in five, six days. We are moving up to our summit rotation tonight. And they're singing because it's good weather. Finally. We've been waiting for this day for two weeks. Final hours of K2. I'm sitting in my tent at Camp 4 and we're supposed to be resting before we move up. I just can't sleep. I'm so excited, I'm so nervous. I'm preparing for one of the most exciting moments of my life. I'm ready for this. This is why I'm here. The moment we set off, it was pitch black. All you can see is the trail of lights from the people ahead of us. The ice wall was a bit traumatic. I've never done climbing on an ice wall with just my crampons and I kept slipping. My heart rate shot up. I had a full blown panic attack. I felt like I was gonna die. I had to filter out all the noise and everything. I needed to calm myself down and calm my heart rate down. At the end of the wall, there's a body there. It's really terrifying every time you see someone that had passed. Cause they're like you, they wanna climb the mountain. They, they hope for the best. That was just a really scary reminder. And once we got to that very last section before you kind of have to walk on the edge and get to the summit. I was like, this is the moment. This is the moment. I was walking on that path. I get to the summit and then I just drop my bag. And for a good 30 minutes, I couldn't stop crying. We're here at the summit of K2. I couldn't believe that this is it. This is not just about me anymore. This is for my family. I've put my family through so much stress doing this. And it's not about my family as well. It's about my country. I made history for my country. I made history for the Arab region. That moment, I can't tell you how surreal it felt. Never give up. These are happy tears. <laughs> if there is a perfect moment, that was it. What an unbelievable achievement. Now to the sunnier climb of Mexico and what used to be one of the country's most isolated and infamous prisons. Islas Marias is on its own island, three and a half hours off the Pacific coast. It finally closed as a prison back in 2019. And since then, there's been a lot of work put in to transform it into a nature reserve and tourist attraction. We went to check it out. nos encargamos de darles el recorrido por toda la isla durante su estancia. Por el carácter de reserva natural y de área natural protegida, solamente podemos estar en el mismo lugar en el mismo tiempo 200 personas máximo. El penal tuvo diferentes etapas. Siempre se manejó como una semi libertad pero en los últimos años ellos ya se les permite traer a sus familias, entonces ellos iban caminando libres, convivían, pero también a su vez tenemos el contraste de tener una prisión en donde sí realmente están encerrados, enrejados, donde la única luz del día era cuando ellos salían a hacer ejercicio. Estuve siete meses, caí en, en el 91 y el mismo 91 salí. Me encerraron a mí porque yo sembré una matita de marihuana en una tierrita que, que no era ni mía. Aprendí a no sembrar eso ya, y a no buscar broncas. Y aquí me tienes tranquilo, que aquí no vine yo, aquí no sabía, hasta ahorita. Estaban los pesos más, más, más pesados. No, yo me la pasé tranquilo, gusto, bien aquí. Pues aquí estaba todo, no, todo como, no estaba como acá. Acá está bien, acá esto estaba como aquí. Cuando vino mi mujer, me dieron una casita aparte para que yo viviera con ella, para que ella estuviera conmigo, pues. No me dio miedo nada, yo no, no me da miedo de esto. Aquí yo, tranquilo, y si tuviera dinerito, volví a venir otra vez. Al llegar aquí el día de ayer, fue una sorpresa el descubrir el mejoramiento que se ha hecho en las islas. No había pavimento, como lo descubrimos el día de hoy, era pura terracería. Había escuelas de torno aquí cerca, 
había la escuela de computación con buena maquinaria, la de Dor y buenas computadoras. Y hace 25 años estuve de capellán aquí en las Islas Marías, atendiendo a los presos, atendiendo a las familias, sobre todo también para el interno, el tener su familia aquí era una rehabilitación afectiva también. Entonces era un lugar muy especial a nivel del mundo entero. El plus que te da la isla de que puedes tener tu contacto muy cercano con las aves, te vamos a estar escuchando vocalizaciones de aves, si, si escuchas. Ese sonido, esa vocalización es de un este, carrenal, ¿no? Y por este lado estamos escuchando otras avesitas que son de chipes y que si te das cuenta y escuchas muy bien, vas a escuchar cómo se encuentran estos, estas avesitas entre la vegetación y en la hojarasca, ¿no? La flora y fauna que se encuentra en esta zona, aves, mamíferos, anfibios, reptiles, endémicos. Las especies más simbólicas o emblemáticas tenemos por ejemplo el loro cabeza amarilla, tenemos también dos colibríes endémicos de la isla, tenemos el mapache que también es endémico de Islas Marías. También fauna asociada a los arrecifes de coral como por ejemplo tiburones gata, eh, playas más amplias, arenosas en la cual vamos a tener eh, anidación de tortugas marinas. Entonces, por, por, por pura... Y es para mí bien importante el haber descubierto en cada uno de los internos un ser humano. El sentimiento que me queda también, además del agradecimiento, pues es de, de alegría. Alegría de haber estado aquí. Alegría de haberme encontrado con gente muy humana. Right, that's all for this week. Coming up next time. Rajan is in Spain, looking at some of the tech that might be watching you on your next holiday. Well, up there. You are purely using my facial expressions to understand my internal emotions. Yeah. Until then, you can find us on the BBC iPlayer and on social media too. We're in all the usual places, along with lots of other great travel content from across the BBC. Well, it's minus 30 degrees out here in the Yukon, so I'm off to find something warm to drink. And I'll see you next time. Bye.